receive your sentencing, there's no legal reason not to. All right, please state your true and correct name. <clears throat> your true and correct name. Jody Arias. Your date of birth. 7980. On May 8, 2013, a jury returned a verdict of first-degree murder of Travis Alexander. On May 15, 2013, the jury returned a verdict, finding the aggravating circumstance that the murder was especially cruel. Both penalty phase trials ended in the court declaring a mistrial. It is now time for entering judgment and sentence. For count one, it is the judgment of the court that the defendant, Jody Ann Arias, is guilty of the crime of first-degree murder, a Class I felony that occurred in Maricopa County on June 4, 2008. It is a dangerous, non-repetitive offense under the Criminal Code in violation of the statutes ARS 131101, 1105, 701, 702, 703.01, 703.05F6, 704, 751, 752, and 801. The defendant waived a precedence report. The court has considered the evidence presented at all phases of the trial. The court has received a sentencing memorandum from the defendant. The defendant has been in custody 2,463 days. Is that correct? Counsel? No reason to dispute, Your Honor. All right, with regard to restitution, on Friday, the court received a motion for restitution filed under seal. With receipts, the court has discussed the request for restitution with counsel. There is no stipulation. The court will set a restitution hearing for June 8th at 8.30 a.m. in this division. Your Honor, it just occurred to me, and I will be asking to withdraw subsequent to these proceedings, but uh, I will be out of state on June 8th, so I would not be available if that motion is not granted. All right. The state indicated June 1st would also work. Will that work for you? Ms. Wilmot? I believe it should, Judge. All right, we're going to set a restitution hearing for June 1st at 8.30. The court is retaining jurisdiction <laughs> over restitution. Ms. Arias, you have a right to be present at any restitution hearing the court sets. If you wish to be present, I will order that you be transported from the Department of Corrections to participate in that hearing. Your other option is to waive your presence and allow counsel to represent you at that hearing. What would you like to do, be present or waive? May I have just a second? Yes. I'd like to waive my presence. The minute entry shall so reflect. You may be seated. Mr. Martinez, do any of the victims wish to be heard? They do. The first individual who will address the court is Heather Schaefer. Ms. Schaefer, please come forward. Right up to the podium, please. Begin by telling us your name. Um, Heather Schaefer. Um, and I have a picture that I would like to put up, but I, so I don't know how to turn it off. All right, we don't have the system on, so we'll need just a moment. Before we begin, did the court also receive letters submitted on behalf of Ms. Arias? No. They were emailed directly to you on Friday. I have not seen them. Do you have a hard copy? I do. We'll need to take a brief recess to review these letters before the sentencing concludes. All right.
Ms. Schaefer. Good morning, Judge Stevens. My name is Heather Schaefer. I am Travis's aunt. This is a picture of how I would like to remember my nephew, his trusting eyes, his effervescent personality, and his charming smile. Instead, I will be forever haunted by visions of his frantic and impossible attempts to cry out for his life through a severed windpipe. I have been beside Travis's five siblings since his death in 2008, and while offering emotional support, we've lived together sharing a rented home in Arizona throughout the guilt phase and both penalty phases. Along with the rest of our family, I have suffered great sorrow and pain during these trials. We have heard countless indignities and unfounded accusations that have besmirched Travis's good name, reputation, and moral character. I have seen heinous pictures of my nephew, which I will never be able to erase from my mind. My residence is in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I have spent countless hours and substantial amounts of money commuting back and forth to the trial. I found it necessary to step down from my position as a Starbucks store manager so I could dedicate my time and support to my nieces and nephew out throughout this trial, which now has been ongoing for over two years. The events resulting from the slaughter of my nephew have entirely overshadowed the relationship I have with my nuclear family. Over the past nearly seven years, I have missed numerous events and family outings that I can never replace, and my marriage has also suffered. All of us, my husband, my children, my nieces, my nephew, and myself, will never be the people we were before June 4th, 2008, when Jody Arias savagely murdered my nephew, Travis Alexander. We all have a deep and unending sadness, which will be with us the rest of our lives. We have problems relating to our significant others and our friends who have never experienced such a senseless and horrific death of a loved one. We will never again be able to look at family photos of Travis and not think of his butchered, nearly decapitated body left to rot. Judge Stevens, I humbly implore you to sentence this unrepentant murderer to the maximum sentence of natural life, so she will never, ever again have that opportunity to destroy more innocent lives like she did to us and to Travis. Thank you. Thank you for your statement. The uh, next person to speak is Hillary Wilcox. She is Mr. Alexander's sister. Hi, my name is Morning. Hillary Wilcox. I'm Travis's little sister. I loved my brother very much, and I miss him so much. Travis was not only my brother, but we were really close friends. I looked up to him. When we got married, my family didn't have a lot of money, and he willingly paid for part of it. My dad was not alive at that time also. And so instead of having a daddy-daughter dance, I had my dance with him. So Travis and I had many of the same goals. He wanted to get married. He wanted a family. I, ha I am married. And I have a family. A family that my brother never got to meet. My brother actually never knew that I was going to be able to have kids because I was having major difficulties having kids. He never gets to meet my, my children. It devastates me that my kids will never get to play with his kids and they can't grow up together. Throughout all of this, many of people have told me that I have been so strong, that I've handled this with grace. 
And I feel that I have. I've been blessed to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And uh, no doubt my faith has helped me through this. <sighs> like I said, I have a family. I'm a mother, and I had to be strong. I couldn't let this affect my family. I couldn't let this affect my kids or let it affect my marriage. But none of this has been easy for me. With great sacrifice and pain to myself, I've done my best to block my brother from my life. I don't want to remember him anymore. Because <laughs> it hurts too much to remember him alive. Because if I remember him, I remember how he was brutally taken from us. And I can't handle it. <laughs> this is what I've had to do so I could cope. So I can handle it. I hate that she has taken my past of my brother and also my future. Memories of him. I do have moments of weakness. And most of the time during those weaknesses, I'm in the shower. And I know it's because that's where she, she killed him. So I have to shake it out of my head and quickly get out of the shower. <laughs> Just Stevens. I know you've seen the pain that she put my brother through. And how she smeared his name falsely. And I hope that you've seen the pain that she put our family through. And I hope that you can give her the back sentence that you possibly can give her because she deserves nothing more. And I thank you for that consideration. Thank you for your statement. Mr. Martinez. Next to address the court is Tanisha Sorensen. Good morning, Judge Stephen. Good morning. My name is Tanisha Sorensen, as I'm sure you know by now. I am one of Travis's little sisters, the one closest in age to him. I've been here every single day on this painstaking trial, just as you have. So I'm sure you know this is no easy task. Every single day that I've sat here has been very painful and wearing on my spirit. Viewing my brother's autopsy photos, hearing the lies, has just been about all I can take. I didn't choose to be here. I didn't ask to be here. But I'm here for one reason only, and that's Seek justice for my beautiful, sweet, caring, amazing brother. I didn't want to be the girl whose brother was brutally murdered. I didn't want to sit here day in and day out hearing the details of my brother's body being tortured. I didn't ask for my life and that of my siblings to be put on blast by every social media network and on every news channel. I didn't want to turn on the TV and watch my family suffering and seeing myself suffer because of the actions of pure evil. I see the pain in our faces and the tears we've cried, and it never stops. 
My family has had to deal with the torment and agony that she has caused, and we will for the rest of our lives. I've continually been harassed by a small group of people that in my mind are just as evil as the one who has done this. These people support her actions and send me a picture of my brother's dead body and his autopsy photos, his blackened face and his slit throat to my email on my Facebook page. These same people said they were going to stand outside the courthouse today to harass me and my family, all because we are fighting for justice for our brother Travis. I did not ever think we would be victimized over and over again just for coming here and wanting justice for a man I loved and cared about. A man who was my brother and my protector. A man who deserved to be living now as I speak. Travis Victor Alexander should be alive today. And I shouldn't have to be here today begging for justice to be served and handed down. This person who has decided to take the role of God needs to suffer the consequences of her own actions. She has come up with lie after lie, more stories and then new stories. Travis should have died a much, in a much later life, long after he became a husband, a father, a grandfather, and maybe even a great-grandfather. He should have been able to see the thousand and one places that he dreamed of seeing, but instead he was brutally murdered by a jealous, obsessive person that decided for herself that if she couldn't have him, nobody else would. This person who once said she couldn't think of anyone that didn't love Travis, that if she killed Travis, she would beg for the death penalty. The one who wrote in her journal that the person who did this sickening crime deserved a needle in their arm. What happened to that? What happened to that, Jody? This road to recovery and repair our family is going on will continue. It doesn't end here. I just want to leave this courtroom in Arizona <laughs> and this evil that sits in this room behind me. I want to remember my brother, Travis Victor Alexander, as a man he was, a man of service, a man of love and inspiration, a man of God, a man who cared so much for others. I want to lay my head down at night knowing his murderer will pay for his senseless murder at, at Perryville Prison for the rest of her life, please. I have prayed every single day before court that she would just come clean and tell the truth. Stop murdering my brother again and again by smearing his name. That she would just tell the truth. I held out hope that she would have some remorse. <laughs> but she has shown no mercy on Travis nor our family. And what I'm asking of you, Judge Stephen, is to please don't spare her any mer mercy in her sins today. Thank you. Thank you for your statement. And last, Samantha Alexander. Good morning. Good morning. I gave an impact statement at the first penalty phase on behalf of my entire family. That statement was extremely filtered due to the rules of speaking to the jury. With that being said, the statement is more personal to me and my experience and a little less filtered. I wanted to start out by talking about the last day I saw Travis. Towards the end of May of 2008, just a couple of weeks before Travis was killed, he came to visit me in my home in Southern California. He was so excited to let me read the intro to his book that he was writing titled, Raising You. 
This was his attempt to inspire and help more people to become the best person they could be, no matter who they are or where they came from. The intro to the book detailed our childhood, what we overcame, how we would not change a single thing about it. Travis and I got in a deep conversation about our life, our crazy childhood, the horrible, unexpected deaths we endured, including both of our parents at a young age. We both agreed that no matter how miserable our lives were at times, our childhood is what made us who we are. Our childhood made us strong and able to conquer almost anything. Our childhood gave us no choice but to rise above our surroundings, change the cycle, and become successful. Travis made the best of the cards he was dealt and became a successful motivational speaker. He wanted to share with the world that you can do anything despite your surroundings. You can be anything you want to be. That was the sole purpose of his book. My brother shared the sad details of our childhood to help others. He exposed private details of our lives growing up to make difference and motivate others in theirs. I am disgusted that Jody used his words of encouragement, the words that he wanted to use to help others that were struggling to assist her in her absolutely ridiculous defense. Ironically, before Travis left my house that day, we got into a crazy discussion about the, death, the deaths we've endured at such a young age. We both shared the fear of losing another family member. It made me so sick to my stomach to even imagine going through another death. I told him I probably couldn't handle it, and he said the same. That was the last time I saw him. I think back about that last conversation we had about death. I think about how horrible and sick I got when we were talking about it. Little did I know, just a couple weeks later, my entire life would be turned upside down. This is one of the worst possible things I can imagine. The day I found out about Travis's death was the morning of June 10th. I was on a river trip with my boyfriend and best friends in Parker, Arizona. I checked my voicemail because I had bad reception on the water when we were getting ready to take the boat out. The first message was my little sister, Hillary. She sang some funny song, and I was busting up laughing. The next message was my grandmother. My heart sank into my stomach, and I immediately had a burning sensation in my gut. She said, Samantha, you need to call me. It's very important. I recognized her tone of voice from before when I knew somebody was dead. I called my grandmother's house and Tanisha answered the phone. She screamed. She said, Samantha, Travis is dead. I could barely breathe out the words, what happened? And nobody knew. She said he was found in the bedroom and the police couldn't provide any details. I was on the verge of puking. I couldn't believe my own ears. I remember hoping I'd wake up from a horrible nightmare, but I wasn't sleeping, and the nightmare was real. After several hours of waiting, I found out that Travis had been murdered and that he had been shot and stabbed several times. I was sick. I could barely breathe. I kept thinking, how could this happen? What monster would do this to him? We packed up and left the river immediately. My boyfriend drove me to Mesa because I was too out of my mind to drive myself. I just couldn't wrap my brain around it. I kept thinking, who would do this? Who would do this? Why Travis? And why my family again? It was the worst feeling of my entire life. It was worse than all the other deaths combined. I felt so hopeless. Could not believe that there was Someone out there, roaming free, that committed this heinous crime against my brother. I started calling friends of Travis's, asking questions. Everyone said the same thing. Travis didn't have enemies. The only person they could think of was his stalking ex-girlfriend, Jody. All fingers pointed to her. I remember who she was because Travis called me, asking law enforcement advice. I believe that Jody 
He said he believed that Jody slashed his tires twice in two different locations. After remembering that, it completely clicked in my head, and I knew in my heart, within a matter of hours of finding out about Travis's death, that Jody was the one that murdered my brother. We arrived to Mesa late on June 10th. After three days of waiting, we got a call that the crime scene was cleared, and we were allowed to enter Travis's home. I remember being so sick to my stomach, knowing I was about to walk into the place my brother was brutally murdered in. We walked in the front door, everything looked pretty normal. We started to walk up towards Travis's bedroom and I could barely breathe. My poor little sister, Hillary, couldn't even go in the room. I remember the first step I made in his room, reality set in. I immediately noticed a large piece of carpet missing from the floor. I saw a hole cut into the wall in the hallway leading to his master bathroom. I looked down the hallway, knowing where the shower was, and my heart sank. My stomach started burning, my ears started ringing, and I could barely hear. My mind immediately started to paint a picture of what happened the day that my brother was brutally murdered. I was so sick. I was standing in the same exact place the horrific fight took place. I could imagine the pain, the agony, the screams, and the fright that my brother was going through. What was going through his head when he was losing the fight of his life. I walked down that bathroom hallway where it was obvious the main crime scene occurred. And I looked at the shower where I knew he was found. My eyes filled with tears and I instantly started picturing my poor brother's dead body in the shower. He was there for five days. Five days he was there decomposing in the shower. I'm sure his soul was screaming for someone to find him. It made me so sick to think that I was having the time of my life at the river while my poor brother lay dead in the shower. After regrouping, we started to pack up the house. We packed up for three days straight. I remember when it would get dark, we were scared someone was going to come back and try to attack us. We were so scared of our own shadows, but we finally got it done. Travis's friends had a memorial for him before we left town. It was amazing. There were hundreds of people there that loved Travis. So many came up to my sister Hillary and I and gave us huge hugs saying how sorry they were and told us what an amazing brother we had. One person at the memorial stood out like a sore thumb. I recognized her from pictures that Travis had showed me before. It was Jody. She had that evil smirk on her face that's similar to her booking photo. I remember getting the chills because she was within a few feet of me and I suspected that she did it. It made me feel so helpless. Deep down, I knew that she killed my brother and I couldn't do anything about it. I didn't want to go to jail or hell because of what she did. So I put my faith in the justice system. On July 15, 2008, 36 days after we found out about my brother's death, 42 days after he was murdered, I received a phone call from Detective Flores. He told me that he had arrested Jody for the murder of my brother. It was the worst weight of our lives, not knowing if anyone was ever going to get arrested for what happened, not knowing if we were next to be attacked, not knowing anything except the horrible injuries my brother sustained and how he must have suffered. I feel so sorry for anyone that has ever walked or will ever walk in those shoes. I had a sense of relief due to the arrest and a sense of rage. I found out that what I suspected all along was correct. I cannot believe that not only did she do this to my brother and left him there to rot, not only did she act as if she had no idea, she had the audacity to go to his memorial in Mesa with a smirk on her emotionless face as if she was envying her work. This person had the nerve to send my grandmother flowers two days after Travis was found, expressing what a good man my brother was and how sorry she was for our family. She had the nerve to write my family a letter on Travis's 31st birthday, the first birthday he didn't get to celebrate. 
She explained how sorry she was. She wrote about what a great man my brother was and how she owed him his, her life. She described the bandit story in full detail. She expressed so much remorse about not being able to save Travis, defeat those evil monsters, and for leaving him there to die. She explained that they threatened to kill her and her family. That she called the police. She claimed she was wrongly accused, and the real monsters were still re that were responsible for this heinous crime are still out there, and that they needed to be brought to justice. She said these monsters deserve the death penalty. If there is one thing I can agree with Jody on in that letter, is that the monster responsible for this, the monster that did this to my brother, deserves the death penalty. I have not had a good night's sleep since my brother was murdered. The endless trial made us hear the graphic details of the murder over and over. The images of my poor brother's dead body will never go away. The justice system has completely failed us over and over. It disgusts me how many rights the defendant has. The victim's rights are a joke in comparison. With that being said, I understand the decisions you made in this trial. I understand why you allowed the delays by the defense. I have seen the public backlash because of it. I am so sorry that you had to go through this experience, not only once, but twice. After the hung jury of the first trial, if there was an option for you to sentence Jody to life row, where Jody would have been treated like a death row inmate for the rest of her life, we would have taken that. The option should be there in a case of a hung jury and a death penalty case. That option would have also eliminated the chance for a tainted juror getting on the jury the second time around. Judges should have the power to sentence life row. It would have spared us all the time, money, and additional suffering to be here. We attempted to plea with Jody by sparing the death penalty and trade for natural life and no appeals. She would not budge. That is the only reason we all had to go through this again. I know that we, are, we have the right to address the defendant directly. Jody has shown no remorse. She continuously makes atrocious lies about my brother, dragging his name through the mud after she dragged his body through his own, his own blood. She stooped so low as to throw her own mother and father under the bus, knowing damn well she was never abused, just to spare her own life. I wouldn't waste my time addressing her because she isn't worth my breath. In closing, I just want to express my appreciation to you. I know this trial has impacted your life. There is only one person to blame for that, and that is Jody. I thank you, Judge Stevens, for being strong enough to see this trial to the end. I know how difficult the decision is to make, and I pray that you will make the right one by sentencing Jody to natural life without the possibility of parole. Thank you. Thank you for your statement. The uh, state does not have anybody else who wishes to address the court. Mr. Martinez, do you want to make a statement at this time? I would prefer to make it after I hear what the defendant have to, has to say, but if you want, I will make it right now. We'll approach, please. <laughs> Mr. Martinez, you may proceed. Hope is uh, never a bad thing. Uh, hope is always a good thing. And in this case, the family of Travis Alexander, as you heard, hoped that 
a death sentence would be imposed in this case. But that is not to be. That will not happen. And in speaking to them, at certain junctures, they take some solace in the fact that the jury, lots of jury, 11 to 1, deadlocked in favor of imposing the death penalty. To them, that provides a small measure of solace. But it's a very small measure of solace because generally, as you see, normally, as you heard, they always, always feel that death is the appropriate sentence. But even though they feel that death is the appropriate sentence, they still have hope. They have hope now that you will see your way to a natural life sentence. And they believe that a natural life sentence is appropriate, not because they want to be vindictive, but because, as you have also seen, what happened in that bedroom or bathroom of that bedroom was a butchery. When they, as they've told me, when they think, and they've also told you, when they think of the stabbing, they can feel their brother's pain. They feel the blade going into him, and it burns them, and they cry, and they don't know what to do about it, just like Travis Alexander didn't know what to do about it. And when they feel him moving away, trying to get away from the defendant as she continually stabbed him, they can hear his cries. They can hear him screaming. It rings in their ears, and it's something that they cannot stop. It's something that they, even though they want to sleep, even though they may want to turn away from it, it is something that rings in their mind. His cries. They know that these are the agonized cries of a wounded animal who's about to be killed. And that's how they think of it. They also can't help feeling as he crawled away down the hallway and it's something that they hope that he was unconscious when she took that knife for the last time. They hope that he's unconscious. But based on what they see or what they saw in this court, they know that he wasn't. They know that he was still alive. They knew that he was still feeling after he had crawled all the way down the hallway and came down to the carpet. They knew he was still conscious when the defendant took that knife and slashed his throat wide open. And that almost makes them crazy. To think that their brother had suffered so many stab wounds, and then, as a coup de grace, they have him feel that blade one last time. And at that point, they are thankful that he wasn't feeling anymore. But what they can't get out of their mind is the brutality as she dragged him back down the hallway and put a bullet in his head. And so they live with this every day. They live with the extreme cruelty of this killing. They live with the extreme distress that their brother must have felt during that, those minutes that it took for this to happened. To them, it was an eternity. They weren't there. But to them, they know that their brother suffered in it enough for an eternity. And so, because of that, they have hope. And they have hope. As I said, they have, they have hope that you, remember, that you will remember that when pondering what sentence is the most appropriate in this case. And I know that there's a sentencing memorandum that has been proposed to you, setting out a request for the alternative sentence. And I know that in that sentencing memorandum, they ask you to conduct a comparative analysis with other cases. But you didn't sit and listen 
in all, to the evidence in all of those cases. You are the person who sat and listened to the evidence, every single bit of evidence in this case. You know about every single stab wound. You know about all of the blood. And you know all about the gunshot. Those other cases are nothing more than ink on paper. Something for you to read. So I ask you to take a look at this case and make a decision based on what you see and what you saw and heard in this courtroom. The other thing that they are hopeful of is that when you consider the issue of remorse, because that's the other issue that continues to haunt the victims, because they truly are victims, as you have seen, even though they didn't themselves personally suffer uh, the wounds, they didn't suffer the stab wounds, they didn't suffer the gunshot, they are still suffering. And one of the things that they want you to consider is the defendant's request that you find that somehow she is remorseful in this case. They hope that you will remember that from one side of her mouth, she was saying what an influential and great person Travis Alexander was. And out of the other side of her mouth, was calling him a pedophile. Was saying things that are almost too difficult to talk about. But not only did she talk about it, she went even further. And as you know, she even fabricated evidence to try to bring her point home to you. Objection, Judge. Overruled. <clears throat> she provided it for your consideration. And it's something that the next of kin is aware of. And it's something that haunts them. They mentioned it to you previously when they addressed you, this issue of Mr. Alexander being a pedophile. And so they, something that, out of one side of her mouth, talks about what a great individual she was, yet, and yet she's so remorseful about it, yet she can stab him figuratively throughout this whole trial, stabbing him with the only thing that he has left, stabbing him to take away the only thing he has left, which was his character. Talked about how much of an individual he was who was involved in this sexual act activities, how they talked to you about that he had been to these websites hundreds of times, these porn websites. All of this stuff is something that they want you to consider when you think about what they have proposed to you as mitigation and specifically this issue of whether or not the defendant is remorseful. They do not believe that the defendant is remorseful and they hope that you see it that way also. There are some other issues that were presented here in the sentencing memorandum, specifically one of them being that the defendant is mentally ill. Well, you heard the testimony from all of the witnesses, including Janine DeMarte, and you know what the explanation for that is. There's no need to go over that again, and it is not a mitigating factor. They also specifically mentioned Things such as no previous criminal history and no propensity for violence. Well, you also heard the evidence that was presented in this case. And you also know what happened uh, back at the address with Mr. Alexander. There's no need to go on any further other than to point out that the next of kin, Travis Alexander's family, is still hopeful. They are hopeful that you will sentence the defendant to natural life. And they see it that way because of everything they have felt, everything they have seen, all the photographs that have been presented in this case. The state also has been present. The state is also hopeful, hopeful that you follow the recommendation of the victims. Thank you. Thank you. The court will take a 10 minute recess to review the letters submitted by the defendant.
proceed, may we approach, please? Yes.
Coach Kim? Yes. All right, the record will show the presence of the defendant and all counsel. The court has reviewed the two packets of letters provided by the defendant. Ms. Wilmot. Thank you. Um, the defense judge is calling Ms. Sandy Arias. She would like to speak to the court. All right, please come forward. Good morning, Judge. Good morning. I'm Sandy Arias. I'm Jody's mother. I'm sure you know who I am by now. I um, just want to let you know that I am the only one from Jody's immediate family here today. Um, doesn't mean that our family didn't want to come. We all love and support Jody, but it's very expensive to be here. Um, it's a financial hardship for us. My husband is not well. Um, when he was here last time, it took him a month to recuperate. So. Um, wanted to know our family is all here in spirit. So. Okay. Hey, we were born into this world kicking and screaming. We go through life trying to figure out life itself. We try the best we can. Does it make us a bad person? It makes us human. On July 9th, 1980, Jody was born into this world kicking and screaming. Growing up, she strived to become a successful, giving, loving, honest person. Then she stumbled on the worst mistake of her life. This mistake tried to degrade her, tried to make her feel like a nobody, tried to take away her pride. When Jody's life was at stake, she defended herself and decided she was not ready to leave this world. She had not completed her goals yet. She was not going to give up in life and fought to stay alive, once again kicking and screaming, and she did. She lived. About seven years ago, she was unfairly incarcerated because she wanted to live. Today, she's fighting a battle for her life. They can cage her, they can strip her of her rights, but they can't take away one thing, her beautiful soul. Jody's the firstborn of four children. <clears throat> she didn't come out with instructions, so we did the best we could with what we knew. I guess the one thing we failed to teach her was how to walk away from an abusive relationship. She hid it from her family, she hid it from her friends. All the signs were there, we just didn't see them. As her mother, I feel like I should have been able to protect her, but I wasn't. I in no way condone what Jody has done, but I do understand it. Jody has brought a lot of pain to so many lives, but she has also touched so many lives with her story. It's not my place to apologize for her actions, but I can say that I am sorry for the loss the Alexander family has had to endure. I can't even imagine what they're going through. I pray that someday they will be able to find peace Although Jody is still alive, we still have lost our daughter. Our lives have been forever changed. Since the day she was born, I dreamed of her becoming a bride and becoming a mother. Those dreams have all been shattered, but they have been replaced by ones of someday seeing Jody walk free. You have the choice to give her a chance at parole, Judge. I only hope that you have it in your heart to see what a good person Jody really is. She's always helped people less fortunate than her. Jody always sees the good in people. She has helped many people in the last seven years. She's written letters for inmates that couldn't write. She has written them poems, sang for them. She has also read to them and drew them pictures. And I'm sure there's many other things that she has done to help people. Jody's bright smile always lights up the room. She's intelligent, has many talents, such as her art and photography. She has excellent writing skills and speaks Spanish fluently. Jody has two sisters and two brothers and countless other family members that love and support her, and we will stand by her always. As I write this letter, I pray that something good will come out of all of this. I pray the Alexander family 
has peace, and I pray for you, Jed Stevens. You have heard a lot of bad things that people have said about my daughter. I listened to it for the past seven years. I have to say it hasn't been easy. I know the beautiful soul she really is, and I know that she is not the monster that she has been made out to be. Thank you. Thank you for your statement. <clears throat> Judge Miss has a few words to say. Judge, I just want to respond to a few of the things that were said earlier. Um, my legal team and I tried to settle this case on four different occasions uh, before trial. We tried two times before the 2013 trial, and what Samantha said was not accurate. I was not the one who refused to settle. It was, Travis, uh, it was Travis's family who not only refused to settle and insisted on both trials, but then they bragged about it all over social media, including posting a group photo on the steps of this very courthouse, holding out all of their thumbs down, refusing to settle. As for not wanting the death penalty, it's my firm belief that death would bring me untold peace and freedom. That's my personal belief. If I died today, I would be free and I would be at peace. For years, that's exactly what I wanted. But I had to fight for my life just like I did on June 4th, 2008, because I realized how selfish it would be for me to escape accountability for this mess that I've created. I have two brothers, two sisters, several nieces and nephews, a mom, a dad, eight aunts. Nine uncles, over 20 cousins that I've grown up with, as well as countless friends, all of whom would suffer greatly if I took my own life or if I allocuted and begged for the death penalty and then got it. I did not drag Travis through the mud. I protected Travis's reputation for years. I did say he was an influential person. I kept his skeletons in the closet all to my own detriment for years. What I testified to was not false. They were not made up. They were not things that I wanted to get out into public either. But when I was on the stand, I told the truth. Your Honor was also here during the second trial when a lot of evidence came to light that supported my testimony from people that never even knew me but knew Travis. I do remember, as I testified to this, I'm sorry, I think I would have testified to this in the 2014 trial. I do remember I do remember the moment when the knife went into Travis's throat and he was conscious. He was still trying to attack me. It was I who was trying to get away, not Travis, and I finally did. I never wanted it to be that way, Judge. The gunshot did not come last, it came first. And that was when Travis lunged at me, just as I testified to, and just as the state's own detective testified two years ago before he and Juan got together and decided to change their story for trial. As for not being abused, maybe I wasn't badly as, as badly abused as Travis and his siblings were by their parents. But I didn't consider it abuse either. I didn't consider being beaten and hit and all those things abuse. That was discipline in my family. That's how my parents were disciplined by their parents. That's why I didn't consider those things abuse. I understand now that that's abuse. So for Samantha to say that I was not a victim of abuse is wrong, because I was. And my family understands that now. And we, like my mom said, I didn't come with instructions. They did the best they could. They didn't do it because they're bad parents. They did it because they thought that they were disciplining us. And that's the best that they knew how. The most important thing I want to say is that I am very sorry for the enormous pain that I've caused the people that love Travis. I never thought I would cause so many people so much pain. I live every day wishing that I could undo what I did to Travis and wishing that I could take away their pain, just put it onto myself. To this day, I can't believe that I was capable of doing something that terrible. I can't even, I'm just, I'm truly disgusted and I'm repulsed with myself. 
I'm horrified because of what I did, and I wish there was some way I could take it back. That's all I have. <clears throat> Your Honor, we're asking the court, as, as I did in the sentencing memorandum, we're asking this court to sentence Ms. Arias to life, but with the possibility of release. And we're doing that, Judge, because based mm -hmm. on, um, as the state called it, a comparative analysis. It's not so much a comparative analysis, it's about sentencing and equity in sentencing. And when this court is able to look at other cases that are similarly situated, then the facts of this case become not as gruesome, not as bad when you compare it to others that have occurred in Maricopa County. And those others that have occurred in Maricopa County where those people, those defendants, received a possibility of relief. When we talk about, according to the sentencing, in the sentencing memorandum, I attached 60 cases. Um, and those 60 cases were pulled from the county attorney's office, specifically from their own information and from the information available by the Maricopa County Superior Court. In those cases, the court can see that they, and I should be clear, those cases are just cases for first degree murder. They do not involve cases regarding second degree murder. And so when you look at um, some of the cases, you look at Moore. That's a case, that's a case where the victim was bound, his eyes, ankles, and mouth, with tape, laces, climbing rope. And ultimately, that victim was left alone and he um, asphyxiated. He choked to death. <clears throat> that defendant received life with the possibility of parole. When you look at Coker, another case on page 14, that defendant killed the victim with a hatchet. And that person um, then went back and shot him. And the victim in that particular case was an elderly victim. 74 years old. That defendant received the possibility of release. And not only did that defendant receive the possibility of release, but you can see that that defendant had prior felonies. He had been in trouble before, but he gets the ability for possibility of release. If you look at um, the Dominguez case, which was on page 12, <laughs> And Judge, I'm just picking out just a couple of these because we don't need to keep going over it. But the Dominguez case, again, that person had, that defendant had prior felonies. The victim was found beaten and bound. He had been stabbed and cut. And, and it was part of a burglary. That defendant received a possibility of release, even after having a criminal history, after having prior felonies. In the Gonzalez case, That person received a possibility of release. And in that particular case, that one, the victim was beaten with a pipe. Beaten so badly he was left for dead, but this particular defendant went back and continued beating him until he was dead. After that, he returns with a knife. This person receives 25 years with the possibility of release. The other cases that, um, some of the other cases that were attached have to do with um, well, the Ross case in particular. Ross, had, the person Ross, he stabbed his victim 25 times and left him in a hotel room. That person had prior felonies, and that defendant received a possibility of release <clears throat> after 25 years. There's other cases that were attached, Judge, that have to do with killing children and gruesome, gruesome details about how these children were killed. And these children were innocent, defenseless people. And they were killed merciless, merciless, mercilessly. But yet those people received a chance at release. And we're asking the court to consider all of these things. And I understand that this court wasn't present for all of those trials and didn't hear all the evidence. But it's important to know that, that with Miss Arias, the facts of what Miss Arias did are not dissimilar from what we see here. And these cases are taken from 2008 up until 2013. <clears throat> so same timeline that we've been dealing with. The, when, 
when trying to decide what cases we should have pooled for this situation, we decided not to pool cases where the state has the ability to choose um, to charge the person with second degree murder. So because as the court knows, and as all of us know, the state has complete discretion when charging. They can choose to charge something as first degree, and then they can choose to charge something less. So this, these cases are just 60 of first degree murders. There are scores, hundreds more of cases where the state chose to charge cases that um, as second degree and then pled those to obviously lesser sentences because second degree murder doesn't even have a life sentence to go with it. Um, I can avow to the court that I know personally of one particular case that was charged with second degree where the boyfriend slit his girlfriend's throat. And because for whatever reason the state chose to charge that as second degree murder, that defendant got a plea for 16 years. So we look at all these different cases and we see that there are similar facts to cases. We see that other people had prior felony convictions. And then you compare that with what has gone on with Miss Arias. And I think it's important for the court to take all of that into consideration. Especially taking into consideration, Judge, the fact that Miss Arias doesn't have any criminal history. And when I say that she doesn't have any criminal history, I mean she doesn't have any contact with police at all until she was arrested, except for occasional speeding ticket. That's it. So this isn't something that you see like a lot of defendants that have come before you, where they have come through life continually repeating to offend, and finally they get up to a point where it becomes so serious that now it's murder. Miss Arias has never been arrested for anything. She has never had contact with police. And when you take that into consideration with equity and sentencing, that's something that we look at the most of the other defendants listed in the um, sentencing memorandum did have um, prior felonies. In the sentencing memorandum, we discussed mental illness. The court is well aware of what the testimony was. Um, she was diagnosed with a mental illness by both the state's witness and by the defense witnesses. That is something that, as I explained in the sentencing memorandum, should also be taken into consideration when deciding whether or not she should have a possibility of release in the future. Um, being afflicted with a mental illness is something that is serious, especially in this country that is not... People aren't given help when they should be given help. And in this situation, Miss Arias lived her life with a mental illness like the state's witness said. It was like a light switch. And environmental factors can turn that light switch on. And that's clearly what happened in this situation. How else do you explain the fact that Miss Arias led her life law-abiding, good-natured, kind, um, until the day of June 4th, 2008? Miss Arias does have family support, and I know that um, her mother, Sandy, was the only person who was able to be here today. Um, we have been in contact with the family since, since the verdict, and, and it is important for the court to know that they all very much support Miss Arias. Um, they don't have the funds to be here today, um, but they, do, they did send letters to the court to read, and they are all behind Miss Arias 100%. One of the things that um, the state talked about is <coughs> Uh, Miss Arias' supposed lack of remorse. And, I, and this is something that I think it's really unfortunate for the Alexander family to feel that way, because I know that does not help with healing. Um, and if there is anything that, that I wish they would know is that, that Miss Arias feels not just remorse. Um, it's, it's something that I have noticed from the time that I started representing her. Um, the way she talks about what happened on June 4th, the things that she has said to me, not in preparation for trial, not in preparation for taking the stand and having to say in front of people that she doesn't know, but it's just saying to people that she knows. Randomly, when we're talking about getting prepared for something or talking about some legal matter, I can tell that she is not paying attention. And um, we'll talk about, hey, what's going on? And those will be the times when she's told me Several times, Judge. Those are the times that she has told me that it's a bad day for her. It's a bad day because she knows what she did is horrible. Because she can't believe that she was even capable of doing something. She has told me over and over again, when she says that she is repulsed by what she did, she truly is. That's not something I told her to say, or anyone told her to say. That is something coming from her own mouth. 
And that's something that she has told me from the very beginning since I met her. She is disgusted by what she did. And she, there have been times in my representation of her that she has just broken down crying. And I know the court has seen her throughout this case and in trial. It is not easy for Ms. Arias to cry in front of other people. That is something that she learned as a child, that you don't cry in front of others. But there are times when she does break down and cry. And Judge, that is something that I have noticed also in representing her. There are times that when we're talking about the facts, that she just can't hold it in. And she talks about how awful she feels for what she did. Um, I think it's important to remember that Mr. Alexander was someone she cared about. Whether they were getting along in the end or whether Miss Arias was trying to leave him in the end, she still cared about him. And all of that was very clear from reading her journal entries. Unfortunately, um, and there is something that I, I guess, unfortunately I need to address because this has, would have had nothing to do with sentencing judge. No one ever called Mr. Alexander a pedophile. And I certainly didn't intend to address any of that information today, but that was brought up by the state. And I think it's important for the court to realize and hopefully not punish Ms. Arias for having to defend herself. Every defendant has a right to defend themselves. And if the government is going to allege charges against them, the defendant has a Sixth Amendment right and a Fifth Amendment right. They have a right to defend themselves. And if defending themselves means that negative information is going to come out, that's what happens. It is true that the defense attempted to settle this case several times, times before I was the attorney on the case and times when I was the attorney on the case. And the state never agreed to settle. So it is. It is so sorry. I am so sorry that that the victim's family had to sit here through trial because I, I watched them and I know how tough it was for them. And Miss Arias knows that as well. But it wasn't because we didn't attempt to settle. And I would hope and I know that the court will not take that into consideration and, and hold Miss Arias accountable for defending herself. The state brought up Miss Arias. Um, fabricating evidence, and I know what the state is talking about. These are letters that were mysteriously leaked onto the social media by supporters of the state. Um, those letters, the state's witness never said those letters were fabricated, um, and they never came into trial. It's inappropriate for the court to take into consideration anything having to do with that. Um, and when the state is arguing to the court that Ms. Arias has called Mr. Alexander a pedophile or talking about fabricated letters. That is information that has never been proven, and the state or, and the court should not um, take that into consideration in sentencing because those are matters that are not aggravating factors and they are not, um, they were never proven. <laughs> Unfortunately, with this type of an unusual case, the, the way that it has gone, um, being unusual, I think, for all of us. Um, It has been difficult for Ms. Arias to be able to um, show her true feelings. Because if she, were to, if she cries, then people say those are fake tears. And if she doesn't cry, then people call her evil. If she says that she's sorry and expresses remorse, people say she's lying. And if she doesn't say anything, it's because she's a monster. But Judge Miss Arias is not a monster. She is not unlike any other defendant that has come before this court many times. It's just the, the fact that for two minutes in her life, she did something reprehensible. For two minutes. But Miss Arias is a better person than those two minutes of her life. She has lived her life up until that point remarkably. And I'm asking the court to take that into consideration as well. There is no sentence that will bring Mr. Alexander back. And there is no sentence that will make these last seven years disappear. We know that the Alexander family is hurting. What, what family wouldn't hurt having to go through something like this? It is the nature of this type of crime. But this case has to be judged not on a lynch mob born out of social media seeking vengeance, but on a judicial system seeking justice. And that's what we're asking the court to do. Not on 
base this on what a mob on social media has to say about who Jodi is, but really who she is and who she was before June 4th of 2008. I have practiced in this court on, for quite a while now, and I have been in here on other cases, um, and I have seen this court sentence many a defendant. Uh, I've seen the court take into consideration the, that defendant's background and that defendant's, the crime itself, and the potential for future for those defendants. And I have sat in this court for settlement conferences, and I've seen the court handle settlement conferences where um, the discussion turns to what other defendants who are similarly situated get in these types of cases. So I know that the court takes these things into, into account when deciding sentencing. And that's the appropriate way to do it. That's what justice is. Justice requires equity. And sometimes equity isn't what victims want it to be. Um, this case has been different from others, not because of the type of case, not because of what happened, but because of the, the strange attraction that it has caused for so many. This court has the experience to know the difference between a lynch mob from social media and their requests, and I'm not referring to the victim's judge, just so we're clear, and equity in sentencing and what is just and what is fair. This is a difficult decision. I don't in any way think this is a light decision at all. The facts are gruesome, and for two minutes, what Jody did was horrible. And the pain that she caused was, was reprehensible. But this case is no worse than so many other cases that have come before this court and many other courts in Maricopa County. And what happened in those cases where those defendants received the possibility of release. It is only a possibility. It's not even a guarantee. It is just the possibility, a hope to live for. We're only asking the court judge to give an equitable decision and a reasonable decision and a decision that is fair in light of the facts of this case. Based on that, Judge, we are asking the court to sentence her, Miss Arias, to the possibility of release. Thank you. All right. Is there any legal cause why sentence should not be pronounced? Mayor. The court has considered the nature and circumstances of the offense. I have considered the aggravating factor found by the jury. I have identified aggravating and mitigating factors and considered those factors in arriving at a sentence for Ms. Arias. As aggravation, the court finds, as the jury found, the crime was especially cruel. The offense was committed with at least two deadly weapons, a gun and at least one knife. The crime involved substantial planning and preparation. The defendant did not render aid to the victim. The defendant destroyed evidence at the crime scene. The defendant went to great lengths to conceal her involvement in the crime. The court has also considered as an aggravating factor the emotional and financial harm to the victim family members. As mitigation, the court finds, the defendant has no prior criminal history. The defendant has family and community support. The defendant has mental health issues. The court has also considered the defendant's childhood background, family history, and her expressed remorse. The court finds the mitigation presented is not sufficiently substantial to call for leniency and that a natural life sentence is appropriate. It is ordered the defendant shall be incarcerated in the Department of Corrections for the rest of her natural life with no possibility of parole. The sentence shall begin today. The defendant shall receive credit for 2,463 days of pre-sentence credit. It is ordered the defendant shall pay a $10 probation surcharge assessment. And as previously stated, the court is retaining jurisdiction over restitution. <clears throat> Ms. Arias, you have 20 days from today to file a notice of appeal 
You have the right to have an attorney represent you. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed for you. If you cannot afford the necessary records and transcripts, they will be provided for you at no cost. Do you understand? Yes. Counsel, is there anything else for the record? No, thank you. No, Your Honor. Your Honor, I would be moving to withdraw at this point in time a reconsideration <clears throat> uh, of April 4th, 2011. That order contemplated uh, joint representation because it was a capital trial pending um, pending trial at that time. Uh, given that that is no longer the case, Ms. Harris has been sentenced to uh, life moments ago by this court. Um, I see that there's a few ancillary issues remaining, but uh, I would, the, the motions for which motion should be filed, um, but pending that, I would ask that I be withdrawn from restitution hearing or any uh, future matters, particularly given Ms. Aries' uh, choice to be non-communicated with me. Um, I believe it would be best uh, for Ms. Wilmot to handle that, and so I would ask that my motion withdraw be granted here this morning. All right, the motion to withdraw is under advisement. Anything else? We are adjourned.